Hello everyone, today we are in Bourneville to explore Minworth Greaves and Selly Manor, two of Birmingham's oldest buildings. They were both moved to the current site in Maple Road at the beginning of the 20th century by George Cadbury, the founding father of Bourneville. This video was recorded during Birmingham Heritage Week in September 2021, so the access to the museum was free. The actual entry fee is four pound. Hello, hello. Thank you. This is Minworth Greaves, a timber crook framed grade two listed medieval hall. It is thought to date from the 14th century or possibly as early as 1250. Minworth Greaves is situated next to Selly Manor and is run as part of Selly Manor Museum. It was originally built in Minworth, near Sutton Coldfield, to the north of Birmingham. By the late 19th century, it was being rented as two dwellings and was in poor condition. Sometime after 1880, it was decided to strip out the house and sell anything worth recycling, leaving nothing but the framework of timber. After falling into extreme disrepair, it was purchased by George Cadbury in 1911, dismantled and re-erected by architect William Alexander Harvey in 1932. When architect William Alexander Harvey was planning the rebuilding of Selly Manor, he realized the need for suitable materials to repair the old house. He scoured the Worcestershire and Warwickshire countryside in search of old buildings from which timbers, old glass and tiles could be bought and used for repairs. It was during this search that his attention was drawn to the skeletal remains of an old timber-framed building on the land belonging to the Birmingham Thame and Red District Drainage Board between the villages of Minworth and Curdworth near Sutton Caulfield. This building was comprised of a medieval whole house constructed using crocs. This ancient method of construction uses a bent tree trunk split in a half length ways to form a pair of matching crook blades which are used as the main supporting timbers at either end of the building. Adjoining the medieval hall, at one hand, was a later larger timber-framed building possibly built in the 16th century. Harvey had actually found an old building in Drawtwich which had sufficient timbers to repair Selly Manor. But having inspected the structure at Minworth, Harvey felt there were enough remains to create a second building in Bourneville. In 1914, Harvey purchased the timbers at Minworth for £25 and arranged to have them moved to Bourneville for safe storage until a time when they could be re-erected. With the rebuilding of Selly Manor not completed until 1916, and the cost and difficulty of such projects during the First World War, the reconstruction of the Minworth building was delayed. In 1921, shortly before he died, George Cadbury wrote to his son Lawrence asking him to oversee the scheme and giving him £2,000 for its completion. Due to the expense and the concern that the entire Minworth structure should not dominate Selly Manor, it was decided only to reconstruct the older section, the medieval hall. The final building was completed in 1931. It became known as Minworth Greaves. Its recreation shows what a one-room whole house may have looked like around 700 years ago. Originally, he would have had a central fire, beaten hearth floor, and small narrow windows with no glass. Minworth Greaves is home to Selly Manor gift shop and tour information. We have now reached the end of the Minworth Greaves tour. So now let's go back outside to see what's going on and to have a look at Selly Manor frontage before we explore the inside of the museum. Museum we have today, so we're very grateful to George Cadbury. So there's lots 
do you guys do as you wander around? Just let my colleagues know that you're together as a group, so we'll let you into the rooms together because we're just spacing visitors out at the moment. So you just let them know you are all together. And that's absolutely fine. And there's also an information point over there for you, which will tell you lots more about what else is going on today around Bourneville. So feel free to talk to my colleagues if there's more information. But enjoy the site, guys. If you have any questions, just find myself or one of our are you aware of who is? This is Sally Manor. The earliest known mention of it was in 1476 when it was leased by William Janet, who was the lord of the manor of Sally, to John Othfield, a human farmer. Sally Manor was originally built as a farmhouse about a mile away on a site now called Bournebrook Road and was known as Smithy's Tenement. In 1561, a Tony and bailiff John Setterford, his wife Phyllis, and her son William Pritchett rented the house. The family prospered and acquired enough money to buy the house and some of the land that made up the manor of Selly. This family made extensive renovations to the house. They replaced the medieval hall, which formed the middle section of the house with the taller brick structure that we have now. The Setterford family remained in Selly Manor until 1608. We are now entering the parlour. The word parlour comes from the French word parler, which means to speak. Originally, this room would have been used as a social space, somewhere to sit down and talk with friends and family. It also would have been used as an additional bedchamber. The section housing the parlour and the solo room above dates back to 1476, making it the oldest part of the house. It was originally adjoined by a large hall which contained the main living quarters. This image shows how it might have looked in the 1500s. Until her death in 1608, Phyllis Setterford continued to live in Smith's tenement. An inventory of her goods made after her death was compiled offering a rare insight to her life and included contents of each room and even items within each cupboard. Phyllis was an interesting character. She was accused, along with her son, of breaking into a property in Harbon, although no outcome is recorded. This illustration shows how the house may have looked at the time of Phyllis Setterford. It is based on her 1608 inventory, which lists the furniture, personal possessions, and even food she had at the time of her death. The Setterford family and their descendants continued to own and live at Smithy's tenement throughout the 17th century. They were the last owner-occupiers who lived there for any significant time. And after this, the building was mostly treated as an investment rather than the home and workplace of the owners. After a number of short-term owners and tenants, the building and land, then known as Sally Hill Farm, was advertised for sale in 1775. This is the hall. The section of Sally Manor was built between 1608 and 1664. It replaced an earlier medieval hall that the parlour section of the house was attached to. 
this room was used for cooking and dining and it would have been the real heart of the house, with many aspects of day-to-day -day family and business life taking place here. By 1775, the house had a new name, Sally Hill Farm. The old timber-framed house was no longer fashionable and an advert for its sale described it as a genteel and convenient dwelling and emphasized the location, the open and healthy air, and its proximity to Birmingham. In 1795, the house was sold again following the death of its owner. The land, which had totaled 65 acres, was divided into two and the status of the old house plummeted. By 1800, the house had been split into two cottages, both were led to different tenants, and the condition of Sally Hill Farm continued to decline. It now appeared fashionably picturesque, which made the house very appealing to artists. Amongst them, Alan Everett and David Cox made frequent visits to the house from around 1840 onwards. Their paintings and the photographs that came later have made the building not only one of the most illustrated in Birmingham, but also left a clear record of its decline. By 1861, there was a complete change in the tenants at the old house, and it acquired a new name, the Rookery. This name may have derived from a parliament of rooks who inhabited the many tall trees surrounding the property. Although the term rookery was also used to describe overcrowded and dilapidated houses at the time. During this period, the house was altered and turned into three cottages, each inhabited by a different family, those of Davis, Thompson and Williams. This is a kitchen. The kitchen is constructed differently to the rest of Sally Manor. It contains far less wood. So far, the date it was built remains a mystery as attempts to date the wood has been inconclusive. The room has a high ceiling to allow the air to circulate, which was better for storing food and a better environment to work in. William Davis, aged 41 in 1861, lived in one of the three cottages. He was an agricultural laborer, as were his brother George and two lodgers. There was also William's wife Anne and five children aged seven and under. Thomas Thompson, a carpenter by trade, was aged 84 and lived with his wife Charlotte and two adult sons. Another Thomas, Gideon. One son was a leather dresser, the other a carpenter. John, a brass wire, and Rachel Williams occupied the third cottage with the five young children. In total, 21 people lived in the rookery. In the early 1890s, the Davis family were replaced by Arthur Williams and his family. Arthur was John Williams' son, who lived in one of the other cottages in the rookery. The house was also less crowded, with only 12 people living there. The rookery was owned by Mary Hannah Postlewaite, who also owned the Sally Grove estate. Following her death in 1892, the land was divided and put up for sale. It was bought, along with several other neighbor plots, by Edward Olivery, an Italian-born wine merchant and local councillor. At that time, the rookery was in poor state, with ivy beginning to creep over the crumbling house. In 1907, Olivery died suddenly, aged 47, after catching a chill when out campaigning during the local elections. His will instructed the sale of his estate and the proceeds to be distributed. George Cadbury, chocolate manufacturer, educator and philanthropist, bought the house 
and quickly came up with a scheme to rescue, preserve and move it. By 1909, architect William Alexander Harvey had started a project to have the Rookery building dismantled. He carried out detailed surveys and made plans of the building before it was moved to ensure its accurate rebuilding. Not all of the house could be saved. Some timbers from years of neglect were of no use, so Harvey sought replacement timbers from other old buildings to make repairs. Work began on dismantling the old house in May 1912. Scaffolding was erected around the building and it was gradually taken down, beginning with the roof and then progressing downwards. Harvey kept a detailed record of the process with numerous photographs being taken throughout. They show that letters, numbers and Roman numerals were painted onto the timbers to record the location of each one. These photographs also reveal that repairs were carried out on the original site before they were moved. This image shows Sally Manor in a state of dereliction in about 1912. The building's saviour, George Cadbury, is pictured on the right. Work began on the rebuilding in early 1913. However, it turned out to be a difficult process. With the outbreak of the war, the cost and scarcity of labourers, problems in repairing a building of such an age, progress was slow. This is the bedchamber. This room in the middle section of Sally Manor was built between 1608 and 1657. It was designed to be a bright, airy space, a room that it was a pleasure to be in. On a sunny day, light flows into this room through the large windows, which at the time of building would have been an expensive luxury due to the high cost of glass. From the beginning, the intention was to reconstruct Sally Manor as a single dwelling as it was originally, rather than the cramped cottages it had become. Much unwanted material was discarded, including small outbuildings, brickwork from the 19th century, and numerous layers of plasterwork. However, the core of the building remained and every effort was made to ensure the principal timbers were kept and carefully restored with sensitivity to the ancient materials. This image shows the reconstruction of Sally Manor in Maple Road. Beginning with the stone foundations and brick fireplaces, the timber frame was then added to the stable base. The project was completed in 1916 and Sally Manor opened the following year as a museum. The introduction of a museum added to the other community buildings such as the rest house, the meeting house, the Ruskin Hall and shops around the village green. Sally Manor is a beautiful house but what makes it extra special is its collection of furniture and domestic objects which were mainly collected by Lawrence Cadbury. He was George Cadbury's son. Lawrence had a keen interest in collecting. He had begun to collect antiques while studying at Trinity College, Cambridge in around 1908. And it was the beginning of a lifelong passion. His interest included 16th and 17th century furniture and domestic objects, and he gradually added items to Sunny Manor over the next 25 years until it was near to bursting. Lawrence Cadbury was advised and supported by antiques dealer Oliver Baker. The two men travelled across the country looking for items to furnish Sally Manor and bring the old house to life. This is the garret. In the 17th century, when this part of the house was built, the garret was probably used for storing food like beans, peas, apples, pears, onions and grain over the winter as it would be cool and dry. It is likely that this room is where any female servants would have slept. The items collected by Lawrence and his father are now known as the Lawrence Cadbury collection and they offer an insight 
about the objects that would have been seen and used daily by people living in houses like Sedi Manor. This is the cellar. The name of this room comes from the French word seul, which means alone. This room was intended to be a private living space for the family that lived there. The rest of the house would have been busy with servants, farm laborers and tradesmen. This room offered the family somewhere quiet to retreat away from the hustle and bustle of the rest of the house. <laughs> I'm a bit uh, porky for this one, so I <laughs> Do you feel like a Tudor? He's not going to smell like that. There's a mirror there if you want to admire yourself. No, no, no. Yeah, which is not 
We now have reached the end of the video. If you enjoyed it, please give it a like and I shall see you in the next one. Bye!